Hi everyone, welcome back to Ask Rabbi Tovia Singer. If you've got a question for the rabbi, please uh, drop it in the comment box below or send us uh, the question on Facebook. This week's question is, can the miracles happen in a Christian church? Now, I've spent many uh, years in uh, churches. I have to say, um, the, the Baptist church in the UK and in Ireland is, is a world apart from the one in the States. Um, I did hear some people um, pray in tongues. Um, that was as far as uh, the miracle, you know, there was no, no one ever got a check in the mail that covered the cost of their new roof. Um, and I uh, didn't see anyone levitate. Uh, there was no one not getting bitten by snakes, but then we were in Ireland, there are no snakes. Um, but can, Chris, uh, can Christian churches experience miracles? Can Christians experience miracles? Your thoughts, Rabbi? I, I I would before I answer that question. Uh, I mean, you, you were in the church for many years. Did you ever see an objective miracle, an, an empirical miracle? Did you ever hear any uh, Irishman born in Dublin, grew up in Ireland, to start speaking fluent Chinese? Did that ever? No. Happen? And to be honest, I don't know if I really ever expected that to be a miracle. So I know the Christians now are going. Ah, that's why there were no miracles. But I didn't. Uh, I didn't really expect anyone to start speaking a foreign language, and I didn't. I think that's why the, you know, the 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 uh, people blacking out, passing out, speaking in tongues. The great thing about those signs is that they don't actually mean anything, and you can't prove that <laughs> what happened. You know, you don't know whether that person actually believes that they're speaking in tongues, or whether they just got too hot whether they psychosomatically make them pass themselves pass out. There's no empirical proof. Um, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a big scientist, um, but I studied a little bit of Newtonian laws of gravity. And frankly, the, the miracle would be not falling down, but flying up. So <laughs> it just seems strange that somehow falling down, especially if you're a cripple, seems very odd to me. The miracle wouldn't be falling down because that you can do in a Hindu temple. It's flying up to the ceiling. That would be very impressive. I Let me just begin by, with a non-biblical answer. I have observed this for a long time, asking people questions like, you know, anybody speaking, in, in, I mean, really speaking the language that they have in the charismatic movement, and they're doing, you know, speaking absolute gibberish. And the key point is they're saying that this is a sign of their salvation. And if we go to Acts chapter 1 and 2, it's very clear that the sign of speaking in tongues is a sign to other people who are present that these people have the Holy Spirit. It's not a sign to God. Now, when people who are in the charismatic movement ask their pastor, but how come we're not, people are not just in Ireland speaking fluent Hungarian, they're told, like, what are, we, what are these people saying? So the answer they're given are, the, are, are what are called unfalsifiable answers. And that's exactly what we expect. Either it's an ancient language that has since become extinct, okay, or uh, it's an angelic language and no one can understand it. That's what my friends we call unfalsifiable. And something is unfalsifiable, run as fast as you can, okay? Judaism is very falsifiable, which means we make... The, the Torah makes very clear claims that the Jewish people will return to the land of Israel, will go through terrible, uh, terrible events in history, and that mankind, human beings, have been around, like me and Jason, for 6,000 years. So if they were able to dig up something like Shakespeare that's 40,000 years old, that would be a very serious deal. Okay? So we're making claims, and then we can see them before our eyes. Now, I want to make this point. Although I have observed this, I will tell you that the Torah is not nearly as sardonic as I am. In fact, the Torah conveys a completely, a very different message. 
So I've become extremely skeptical of this. I did, I will tell you, when I first began to encounter the Christians and get to know them, I kind of was expecting, based on the Torah I had, the Torah I'd been studying all my life, I expected them to really be doing miracles. And then I was shocked by what I saw was chicanery all over the place from top to bottom. I was stunned by that. Um, I, I, you know, people are healed. You know, what, what they're doing is they're, I was observing just eliminating failures. So they would say, this person has cancer, God forbid. And if the, per, if, you know, one in, let's say, five, of a certain type of cancer, there's a 5% uh, cure rate, you know. So they would announce that it worked, but the 19 who passed away, no announcement. Or if someone said, Pastor, um, I'd like to find a husband. So you should sow seed, uh, make, donate, whatever it is, I'm going to pray for you. A year later, the young lady comes to the pastor and says, here I am a year later. You said it would happen. It didn't happen. And the pastor invariably will say, will blame the victim and say, you didn't have enough faith. Which theologically makes no sense in Christianity, because in Christian theology, no one has enough faith. No one could do it on their own. Romans chapter 3. So it theologically is absurd. So, it, but as I said again, the Torah is presents this a little differently. In scripture, is very clear that idol that idol worshippers can do miracles in the name of their gods. And we're introduced to this obviously in the book of Exodus. We are able to see that Pharaoh's magicians are able to replicate the miracles that Aaron and Moses were doing. It becomes very clear that when they do encounter hail, they are going, this is the this is the finger of God, because hail now is fire and night water together, and that that they just could not work out. But the key is, from the Torah's perspective, absolutely, if somebody comes to you, in fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1, the Torah says, it first of all begins, now, just as a little point here, the Christian Bibles, chapter 12, verse 1, 32 in a Christian Bible is Deuteronomy 13, verse 1 in a Jewish Bible. So just so people aren't confused. The reason is that Stephen Langston wanted the the Archbishop of Canterbury, a man I think you know personally, kidding, but uh, they divided up for obvious reasons. But the key is someone who comes and 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 you don't have to keep the commandments anymore. He shows you a sign or a wonder. What is a sign? What is a wonder? Os, Mofes, means he says this is going to happen, and it happens. He performs a miracle, an empirical miracle, not the Benny Hinn stuff. Like Benny Hinn's like walking down the aisle, throwing people out of the wheelchair. No, it's <laughs> actually showing miracles. And then he says, so there's one of two things. One is, you, you, you add to the Torah, take away from it. Two, follow other gods your fathers did not know. The Torah says, and the, do not follow that prophet or dream of dreams. I did not send him, saith the Lord. Now this raises a very important question. It raises two questions. First of all, why would God permit false religions to produce genuine miracles. From the Torah's perspective, and I said, I'm waiting for the re for to see something like eyes regenerated. I'm not seeing it. But uh, the Torah, from the Torah's perspective, absolutely is going on. Why would God allow a false prophet to perform miracles? The Torah answers that question. Pharaoh first all says, do not listen to the words of the prophet of dream of Jesus, says the Lord, I am only testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments, the commandments to follow his voice 
and you should cleave to him and hold fast to him. And then it tells us that that prophet of dream dreams is a false prophet and should be put to death. So number one, the Torah absolutely makes it clear that false religions can produce miracles. Why does God permit it? So there's really a two-layer reason why. The, the, the first reason is God is testing us. And the second reason is, imagine a world, you know, often when people ask a question, I, 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 do, I play the what if game. What if no false religion could produce miracles? That means only Judaism is producing miracles. Okay? Only rabbis are casting out demons. Okay, there is, by the way, as a, a little caveat here, in Luke, um, we actually we have a very strange little piece there where, the, very famously, Jesus is casting out dev, a demon or or performing miracles, or healing people, and he's being accused of doing it in the name of the devil, right? So in 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 the Mark's version of that. He's going, could, you know, would the devil, you know, cast out devils and so on, you know, a house against itself. But in Luke chapter 11, we have something very interesting. This is an L source. In Luke 11, I think it's verse 19, Jesus says, but your, 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 your people are doing the same thing. So why don't you tell them they're doing it in the name of the devil? It says, your sons are doing this as well. Okay. So this is very critical. In that, if the only miracles was was wrought forth by those who followed the God of Israel, what would happen to everyone? They would lose their free will. And therefore, it's vital that if miracles are performed for the Jewish people, as God keeps his promises, then miracles must happen within idolatry so that free will is not injured. Because God does keep his promise. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, God says, Before you I place good and evil, life and death, you must choose life. So free will would be injured if, if miracles did not occur in the name of foreign gods. And God says, just don't follow it. I'm only testing you to see if you love me. In the bigger scheme of things as well, I think we the, a fairer question would be... Um, I mean, obviously, we ask why do um, good things happen to bad people, um, but it, we also have to ask um, why would he not cause amazing things to happen to people that needed his help just based on their faith? So it's kind of, I think it's a little bit small-minded maybe to say that um, because it's a Christian church, the people in it don't deserve his help, or because a person doesn't have a certain faith, um, they don't deserve his help in obviously god looks at all his children compassionately and if they have needs he can make amazing things happen well that'd be fair wouldn't it it would be but it's important that um if 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 you if you're married you're going to want to be talking to your husband and not your boyfriend I mean, that's important and why does why is god so patient and hoping that people would repent. Why is it taking so long for the Messiah to come? I mean, here we are, and I think I, even the Christians that I know, I, just about everyone I know, feels that we are probably living in prophetic times. In, in, the, in the Messianic age, we are observing prophecy unfold, unfold before our eyes. The question is, why are you taking so long? I mean, we've had Jacob's trouble. We've had the state of Israel. But Jerusalem is not liberated for another 19 years. It is just, in Yiddish, it's a long time. Why did God go to Pharaoh and, like, 10 plagues? Couldn't he just do one and get it over with? And why did, like, God, like, why did God need Pharaoh's permission altogether? Why did he just make all the Egyptians drop dead and just the Jews go out? The answer is that the Almighty hopes and that, that every person would repent and every person would turn back to him. And that's what we're observing today, where Hashem is patient 
And therefore, those of you, I want to say this to you who are not Christians and, um, and are meeting folks who are, just remember how patient God has been with you. And please have that Emulate God, Kadoshim to you, Ki Kadosh Ani Hashem Likecho. Be holy. Why? Because we're called upon to be like God, and um, be holy like the Lord your God. And therefore, be patient with the Christians. It takes them time. They have been raised in this, and Hashem certainly is foreboding, is patient in waiting for them to come to know about the one God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it's been my experience that no, there's nothing you can say that's going to change their um, their view. All you can do is offer a good argument and hope that they'll consider it. So uh, that, getting angry doesn't help. You're right. You, you have to be patient that's and what, give them time. But if you go to the scripture, it will work. You just don't get angry. If, if it if it becomes a food fight, really, it's over. You you can. Uh, win a battle but lose a war, and do, in, for the most part, even though as a child I thought that Christians were basically like the Taliban, uh, I discovered that, that so many of these Christians are really very good people, very sincere, they just have to process information in a certain way, and that is based on the scripture, not based on some sort of taunting argument or some sort of silly question like did Jesus wear diapers? That is exactly how to shut down a conversation. You'd rather say, let's go back to the Jewish country. That Christians will find very, very attractive. Just be patient with them. Don't be um, argumentative with them. And, um, and today, look, Jason, you and I have witnessed not tens, not hundreds, but thousands of people who have who have embraced the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, left the church. It's happening in numbers that stun me. So we're seeing that before I say It just means look at Scripture, go to the Bible with them, be patient, slowly, and, um, and pray to Hashem for guidance and wisdom. Amen. Excellent. Thanks very much. So there we go. That was uh, today's show. Thanks for joining me, Rabbi Singer. It's always such a pleasure. And uh, we'll see you all again very soon. Bye-bye.